do you remember when the Patronus quiz came out on Pottermore? Do you remember being shocked by how few questions there were? Or how random the questions seemed to be? Were you surprised by your results, or even find yourself disagreeing with them? Turns out there may have been a reason for that. Even Potter fans with the most basic of knowledge will tell you that the Patronus charm is used to ward off Dementors and will take the form of an animal when cast by a highly skilled wizard or witch, an animal with whom the caster shares their deepest affinity. Yet most people were still unhappy with their results, their Patronus taking the forms of animals they had never heard of or even liked. But fear not, I have found the answer to why your Patronus may not have been to your liking, and it doesn't involve looking up a bunch of facts about that specific animal. It's all a load of festival dung. Allow me to explain. Pairing human personalities with animals is a highly subjective process. If you hate cats, you might categorize your least favorite teacher from high school as a cat. But if you've loved cats your whole life, you might say that your favorite teacher shares a lot of qualities instead. In all honesty, I think of Patronuses the same way I think of horoscopes and fortune tellers. Even in the wizarding world, fortune telling is considered a hoax by many characters that we consider rational, yet psychics and mediums are somehow thriving even in this hypercritical age that we live in today. And that's all thanks to P.T. Barnum of all people. Yeah, that Barnum. P.T. Barnum was a master psychological manipulator, who is said to have claimed, we have something for everybody. He is also famously known for the phrase, there's a sucker born every minute. Barnum statements are statements or phrases that appear to refer to very specific people, but are actually just general statements about most people. The Barnum effect also lends itself to the Fourier effect, or the acceptance phenomenon, where most people will generally accept any personality feedback, no matter the source. It's why your horoscope description can be accurate whether or not you believe. It's why BuzzFeed is still cranking out articles that tell you what your manic pixie dream girl name would be. It's why fortune tellers and mediums are still making money. It's why you can now pay to take the Mayor's Briggs test. And it's why many people accepted their Patronus test results even if they disagreed. The facts of all categories can be applied to anyone, and we are willing to accept anything. Of course, there's a difference between taking an online personality test and an author pairing her characters with animal representation. And while I personally think there is still very little linking one specific character to one specific animal, I'm very interested in how Patronuses are used to reflect the relationships between characters. I doubt that it is a coincidence that best friends James and Sirius have Patronuses that match up with Harry and Ron's. But I still laugh at some of the observations made by some fans. Well, one in particular. The notion that Ron and Hermione's Patronuses reflect their relationship because Jack Russell Terriers were bred to hunt otters. I laugh because Jack Russell Terriers were not bred to hunt otters, they're bred to hunt foxes. There is also such a thing as otter hounds, so if Rowling was going for that relationship between Ron and Hermione, there was an easier way. So is there something to be said for a Patronus's relationship to other Patronuses? Or is it all just more Thestral dung? There are only 24 characters with confirmed corporeal Patronuses in the Harry Potter world, and that number gets smaller when you narrow it down to characters Harry personally knows and has seen cast the spell. That leaves a grand total of four couples for us to examine. The relationship between Ron and Hermione's Patronuses are probably the most well known. Dogs on the whole hunt otters. Ron hunts Hermione, at least based on what the Patronuses were when they were teens. Compare that relationship to another future couple around their age, Harry and Ginny. The animals are pretty similar looking and are part of the same family of mammals. And while deer are most often hunted by humans, hunting them from horseback is not uncommon. This is especially interesting to me when you consider who liked who first and the history and growth of Harry and Ginny's relationship. Two future couples and we already see a pattern of emerging predator-prey Patronus forms. Keep in mind that all of these Patronuses formed before the relationship ever started. I believe the Patronuses in these examples are a symbol of compatibility within these couples. For comparison, consider Harry and Cho. Both of their Patronuses take the form of prey animals, and their relationship ended shortly after it started. Like I said, these are all Patronuses that formed before the relationship started. What about the Patronuses of a long-lasting and loving relationship? Lily and James are characters who we never meet, and whose Patronuses are never confirmed in book canon, but are considered fact by virtually every fan. Their Patronuses are a break from the predator-prey relationship established thus far. I would argue due to the complexity of the Patronus charm that neither of them successfully cast corporeal Patronuses until they had joined the First Order of the Phoenix and after they had started dating. Based on the fact that McGonagall has an animagus form of a cat as well as a Patronus that is a cat, we can make the logical jump that even if James had learned the charm earlier in his life, his Patronus would have matched his animagus form of a deer. I'd even argue that it is unlikely his Patronus could ever change, but this video is already very off the wall. This leaves two lines of thought when we consider Lily's Patronus. One, 
Lily's Patronus was always a female deer. Two, Lily's Patronus was once another animal and changed into a deer. Rowling once described Patronus forms as generally taking the shape of an animal with whom the caster shares the deepest affinity. If the first option is true, we can leave. And if Lily's deepest affinity is the perfect match for James, then the video would stop here. But if the second point of view is true, if Lily's Patronus changed to match James, there are many more questions that need to be asked and answered. Why did her Patronus change? In a Bloomsbury Q&A live chat back in 2007, Rowling was asked about James and Lily's matching Patronuses. Rowling said that the Patronus often mutates to take the image of the love of one's life because they so often become the happy thought that generates a Patronus. This presents an interesting conundrum. Consider this scenario. These two wizards are friends, and their Patronuses are these animals, and their happy thoughts are generic happy thoughts of friends, family, and personal accomplishments. Now, they are a couple and have been for several years. Consequently, their Patronuses have taken the image of their loved ones and swapped. But we never hear any examples of this happening. Secondly, if Lily's happiest thought is of James, wouldn't her Patronus be a stag and not a doe? I'll come back to that question, but since we're on the subject, let's look at the only couple where at least one of their Patronuses canonically changes due to the relationship. Tonks and Remus. Tonks' Patronus before the change fits right into the pre-established pattern of predator-prey couples. Before it changed, her Patronus took the form of a jackrabbit, while Remus's took the form of a wolf. Wolves are predators to rabbits, thus they are a compatible couple. But when they start hanging out more in Harry's fifth year, her Patronus starts to take the form of a wolf as well. Is this because her happiest thought is of Remus? Well, maybe not. Things other than falling in love can cause one's Patronus to change forms. On Pottermore, Rowling lists bereavement, falling in love, or profound shifts in a person's character. The third option is the most interesting to me, and I think the most likely explanation in this situation, as well as in Lily's. Don't forget, before marrying James, she considered him to be an arrogant and bullying toe rag, and I think it would take a great shift in her character as well as his for that opinion to change so drastically. Allow me to speculate a bit, but Tonks is such a wild, untamable spirit. She became an Aura immediately after graduating and qualified in under three years. I like to imagine she would find the idea of love and marriage quite out of her wheelhouse. But she starts hanging out with Remus more and realizes this may not be true, and her character starts to change as she herself changes, resulting in her new Patronus. That would mean Tonks' Patronus is not actually the image of Remus's Patronus. And back with Lily. Her Patronus is not a stag like James, but a doe. Her Patronus is the female equivalent of his, not an exact replication. This speaks to the profound shift in character Rowling mentions, and to me says she has changed as a person into someone new. She is still very much her own person, but her relationship with James changed her quite a bit. I argue that the same is true for Tonks, that her relationship with Remus has changed her character in profound ways. The only reason this may not be true is because with deer we can see on their heads what sex they are. Wolves, it is much more difficult to determine their sex from a distance. If I could ask Rowling anything. It would be, is Tonks Patronus a male or female wolf? While there has been talk of a few Patronus reveals in future Fantastic Beast films, until then, we are left only to speculate. Thank you so much for watching this video after such a long break in between videos. This is my first time recording my own voiceover, so please be gentle in the comments. I know it isn't perfect, but it's the best I could do. Uh, I've also added a link to my Instagram, which I update a lot more often. I'm sorry that this video wasn't really strictly an essay, but was kind of a half essay, half um, theory video, but uh, I thought I'd give it a try, and I've wanted to talk about this Patronus theory I've had for a while, so I'm glad I got a chance to do it and that so many people uh, stayed this far to see it. Thank you so much for watching again, and I'll see you in the next one.